Everybody, good evening. It seems to me that Wojciech is a very, very difficult piece to open up. But I'm dying to ask, has anybody here tonight not seen it? Right, so a smattering have and a smattering haven't. And of those people who know they haven't, uh, how are you feeling? Are you feeling, um, <laughs> are, you, are you feeling a little bit uh, expecting to be daunted, a little nervous about what awaits you? Um, yes, yeah. I think this work is, is one of the most significant works of the 20th century. It's a difficult listen, but it's a very powerful experience. Now, all over the world this year, we are celebrating the 200th anniversary of the births of two of the greatest opera composers that ever lived, Verdi and Wagner, and I'm sure many of you are aware of that and perhaps enjoying that. The, the person who is not getting the same treatment and the same emphasis is Georg Büchner, who wrote the play on which this opera is based. It's his, in fact, last week was his 200th as well. Now, when you listen to this piece and experience it in the theatre, it is an extraordinary fact that the man who wrote it is, was the being 200. You know. He died when he was 23. And Büchner died of typhoid, and he just managed to write enough to secure a reputation. Wojciech was the last play that he wrote, but it was years, years later, in the 1870s, before anybody tried to do something with what he'd written. And I think this is so important part of understanding something about it. And you'll have noticed that I've referred to his play with a different pronunciation from the one that we all use. He wrote a play called Wojciech, W-O-Y. But for years, until the end of the 19th century, nobody looked at his plays. Another of his plays, by the way, is Danton's Death, that was played at the National Theatre a few years ago. And there's an opera. Uh, by von Einem, based on it. Uh, he wrote a small number of plays, and they're all very valuable and very interesting. But by the time anybody got to doing anything about his plays, the ink had faded, and Buchner's handwriting, you know, was tiny, was microscopic. And so the man who was responsible for editing, Wojciech, didn't even see the why in Wojciech. He couldn't quite read it, and he had to make sure that every word was found. And he thought, he concluded, that he'd written a play about a man called Wojciech. And that's what he printed, and that's what Berg saw, and that's what we call it. But actually, it should have been all along Wojciech. But in 1914, this play was shown for the first time in Vienna, and Berg was there. And Berg said, well, somebody's got to write an opera on this. This demands music. Now, who was Wojciech? Well, he was a soldier. He was just a common soldier. He was a man of infinite sensibility, imagination, and intelligence that was sat upon. And the point of this story, in its simple, direct way, in these short scenes, the longest is no more than 10 minutes, was to show how a soul could be destroyed and brought down to such terrible mental state of incomprehensibility, sadness, feeling of deplorable failure, um, and ending up in his own inevitable suicide. Wojciech was a common soldier, but by the time the opera begins, he had had for some time a relationship with a girl called Marie. They'd had a child. They're not married. Uh, he has hallucinations. He has a very, very fantastical imagination. He sees mysterious meanings in the most simple things like a sunset. In order to cope with his life, he tries to earn a little bit more money. In the first scene, we see him with his captain, the Hauptmann, and he has to look after the captain. In the first scene, he's shaving the, his captain's part of his duties, and they're sort of talking, and he, he doesn't say very much to begin with. But um, when, the, when the captain starts taunting him that he's had a child born out of wedlock, things, he's, he starts building up inside him that he wants to be able to talk about it, to speak about it. Okay? And he said, I'm sure the good Lord wouldn't think the worse of me if my child hadn't been baptised. 
I mean, didn't he say, suffer the little children to come unto me? And the captain is, is very put up by that. Well, what do you mean? What sort of answer is that? How dare you quote scripture at me? So he bursts out into this wonderful passage. And he says, poor folk like us, via armor loit. Armor is the German for poor. You see, my, my dear sir captain, it's money, money. We don't have money. How can we look after a child of ours and make them moral if we can't afford to put proper clothing on them? <coughs> he says, I would love to live as you do and have a lovely silk hat and a gold chain and perhaps some you know, glasses if we needed them. But it's not like that. It must be so wonderful, sir, to be virtuous. <laughs> and this word virtue, Tugend, very strong, beautiful German word. Yeah? But I'm just a poor chap. I don't have a chance. I think that me and my like, if we ever get to heaven, we'd be put in charge of helping with the thunder. It's a brilliant image, that. Brilliant. And he, the word thunder, he, he thunders it out in the, in the captain's face. And the captain is incredibly upset that somebody's trying to get back at him. And he's never imagined that, that Rothschild could say this sort of thing. Okay? So let's just do the bar of the armor Lloyd. With yeah, with the four notes. All right, Jim, the four trombone notes. If you're on the night, sing, sing, and the heart man felt, felt with kind gent heart. Da sitzt einmal eines, eines Gleichen, Auf die moralische Art in die Welt. Man hat auch sein Fleisch und Blut. Ja, wenn ich ein Herr wär und hätt einen Hut und eine Uhr und ein Augenglas und kein vornehm Reden, ich wollte schon. It must be nice to be virtuous. Es muss was Schönes sein, um die Tugend, Herr Hauptmann. Aber ich bin ein armer Kerl. Unser Hals ist doch keiner to do the thunder. Schon gut, schon gut. Ich weiß, der ist ein guter Mensch. Ein guter Mensch. But you run around too much, Wozzeck, he says. You should calm down. You always make me feel so nervous. Well, that's for a, for a man, a monosyllabic servant. That's quite an outburst, this concept that if we ever get to heaven, us poor folk, we'll be put in charge of helping with the thunder. It's a terrific riposte to this man's insensitivity. But of course, in 1925, this music would have been impossibly difficult to sort out in your mind, and you're used to your Brahms and your Tchaikovsky, you know, to suddenly be confronted with this very different palette. That, ladies and gentlemen, in an egg cup, is the beginning of what what this opera brings, what it can say to us all. And just a, a little bit of the challenges that we face, my wonderful pianist, Jeffrey, the, the Wozzeck Philharmonic, I call him. Um, <laughs> this will be the beginning for some of you. It will be the first step uh, in a journey that will bring this, this difficult and wonderfully rewarding music closer to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.